And we back with another one. Got a classic for y'all. Vice Lombardi. Y'all, y'all know who I am. I'm not, I ain't got to talk about me. Uh, but John Owning. Okay. Let me ask you a question, man. When did you become like edge god to to Cowboy Nation, right? Like, you know, when for 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 some reason I've been lumped into, you know, the O line bag. Like, that's fine. I could take O line bag, but 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 tell me when did you become like the edge dude for everybody? Uh I don't know, man. It goes back like when I first got out of college, I was trying to like I was really interested in the draft, really interested in the Cowboys. And like, I would just like watch film and stuff on my, on my own time, just doing stuff. And then I joined the scouting Academy with Dan Hatman. And that really like, really like drove home how much I like, like scouting players, evaluating players, learning how to write reports, learning how to, you know, evaluate players on at, live on tape, you know, listening to all these tapes with like big, coaches and stuff and just learning all that kind of thing and then i think during the time when demarcus lawrence came out i really started honing in on edge defenders mm-hmm. and really started like studying not only like just studying their position but studying the techniques and stuff that would make them great and i think it really goes hand in hand kind of what i do on my off time you know i'm a black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. and a lot of the like hand-to-hand combat part like the hand fighting part of rushing the passer and the ability to create leverage, the be able to the drive an opponent off of their spot when they don't want you to. A lot of that stuff is uh, very similar to things you do in jujitsu, do in judo, do in wrestling, all these type of different grappling arts. So I think it really just clicked in my head a lot quicker than it did the other positions. And it made me want to dive deeper because I felt like the more I dove deeper on like pass rushing technique, footwork, it felt like I was learning the same amount of stuff in jujitsu and I could kind of use both in both worlds, you know? So just from there, I've just, been something i've really honed in on and it looked like you know you don't see too many other people really talking about edge defender about pass rush like that so i just kind of developed it as my niche and i've just been really leaning into it year by year by year and the more and more i learn the more fantastic voices i get to talk to and the more you know nfl players i get to lean on to uh you know bounce things off of them so it's just every year i feel like i understand things more and more and more that's so odd you say that, man. You ever did Muay Thai? You ever done some Muay Thai a little bit? Yeah, I did Muay Thai for like six to eight months when I first started jiu-jitsu because I was kind of had the dream of being an MMA fighter type dude. Well, there's a lot of offensive line in Muay Thai. Like, you know, like we just we just work in different levels and, you know what I'm saying, sweeping somebody just has a lot of, all right, I'm pulling you here, but I'm doing something up here just yeah. to, you know what I'm saying, clip you right there. Like it's, it's, it's exactly it's, like judo. It's exactly yeah. like judo, the same type of thing, the type of the manipulate somebody's weight, use movement to put their weight on different feet, you know, to create, you know, different advantageous opportunities for you to let go of your attack. So, it, you know, all the martial arts, I think, kind of can, can kind of, you know, lend itself to learning about, like, the trench play and the hand-to-hand combat part of the football, for sure. See, it's funny, man. Because I, was, it, I mean, go ahead. sorry about that. No, sorry, please. but if you think about it, you know, like, wrestling and boxing and Muay Thai, these are, like, the first sports that have, were ever created. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of arguments in both the boxing and the wrestling communities about which sport was actually first. Were people fighting each other first with their hands or were they wrestling each other? And when you have these sports that date back, you know, millennia like that, they know the best ways – you know, biomechanically to do certain things. Like when you're trying to move somebody from point A to point B, if you watch wrestling, they're going to have a lot of the same principles that you're going to see in offensive line. You're going to see kind of the same footwork patterns, the same, you know, keeping your elbows tight, creating that torque, you know, creating leverage with the hip bend and the being lower than your opponent, but not too low because then you can get snapped down, all these type of things, your weight distribution. If you're leaning too far forward on somebody, then you can get snatched and trapped and your weight will lose, you know, all these different types of little details that I think really lend themselves to both. And you can see them happening in both on a consistent basis. John, I don't, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to have to find the first pass rusher that, you know, pulled a Jersey or that, you know what I'm saying? Or that, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, grabbed a wrist and trapped it and controlled it. We got to find the first pass rusher that did that. And somehow figure out where they're martial art. Because I know that you're a you're a dangerous dude and you know, me and you've talked about, you know, the whole martial arts thing, the training and all that. But just as you talk about it now, putting it all together, somebody had to have been a martial artist and they say, you know what, I'm just gonna <laughs> grab you. I'm gonna take control of your limbs. I'm gonna, you know what I'm saying, use your use your weight against you or or hip toss you like Michael Parsons would do, um, Havenstein or whatever, right? So it's it's yeah. interesting hearing you talking about that. 
And I, I think you've seen in the past, you've seen a lot of like teams that hire like pass rush coaches or hand combat coaches. They hire guys with martial arts experience. I think of um, what's to do with the Browns that was under Bill Callahan that was running the offensive line thing. With oh. the gut, the the big dude with the gut. Yeah, and he, he was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy in Arizona where I went in college. And I mm-hmm. remember seeing him at like no-gi tournaments and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's just a big, massive guy because he was an NFL offensive lineman as well. And you just saw like the big ma- – but then he has become a really good coach and he always uh, gives a lot of credit to his time doing jiu-jitsu and how it learned – taught him how to like really the biomechanics of how to strike, of how to like position his body. And it really helped him click and helped him – learn how to teach because he was teaching in jujitsu and that lend itself to helping him teach offensive line. And he's a very, very successful offensive line coach. I know Bill Callahan, everybody who really follows offensive line play knows he's one of the top offensive line coaches in the NFL. And he brought this guy in specifically to help teach his guys hand techniques and specific like pass blocking techniques. So that's really, it, they like I said, it really lends itself hand in hand between the uh, martial arts and the, you know, hand to hand combat, the trench play of football. One day, not today, and it may not it may not be this year, but we just gonna do a whole show trying to figure this out. Cause once you got going let's on it, it, that's that's to. that's fascinating as hell, man. But let's uh get into it though. As far as your defensive lineman, because you know, ends and tackles, they're they're cousins. I mean they're not the same, but they're they're cousins. Um, do you prefer the technique guy or the super athlete guy? Cause when I'm evaluating D lineman, I'm coming from an X center standpoint, right? And and I never played D line, but I know a shit ton about it. Cause I had to fight these dudes for, you know, for years, you know what I'm saying? So I've always loved the technique guy. Cause you're not just running down the middle of me. I wasn't very powerful, but I was technical. So I could deal with a technical guy. I hate when a zero technique, but just run down the middle of me super strong. I hate having to deal with those guys, right? But we're just evaluating. Do you like the technical guy, and I'm setting you up, or the super athlete guy with with little technique? I think obviously you would prefer somebody that has a little bit of both, but if you had to take somebody from one bucket or the other, I think I would take the athletic guy just because you can teach them to be technical, but you can't teach a technical guy to be athletic. So if you're talking about evaluating somebody for the NFL and their growth potential, you definitely got to value the guys with the athleticism that can learn and because they can become technical, but like I said, technical guys, they're not going to become athletic overnight. They're not going to ever become athletic, most likely. So, you know, from that's, the, I think, a different a differentiation from, you know, when you're evaluating like, you know, free agents to come to the Cowboys. Give me the technical guys all day if they've already been in the NFL and we've seen how, you know, their athleticism is expressed in the NFL and how their technique is expressed and how that translates already to the NFL. But if we haven't seen them in the NFL yet, and they're just kind of a blank canvas. Give me the athletic guy over the technical guy for sure. I struggle with the super athlete sometimes. And of course, if if you can meet in the middle, fine, perfect. Good for you. I struggle with the super athletes sometimes because they have been a super athlete their whole life. So they build up bad habits, right? And yeah, the idea is coaching is supposed to fix you, but man, if you got eight years of bad habits, let's just say it, it takes four to fix it. That's your contract. You know what I'm saying? So we got some dudes in this draft and some of them are technique guys, but they may not be the best athletes. It's a lot of them like that too. But then we got some dudes, <laughs> but then we got some dudes that are just the run down the middle of you champions, mm-hmm. but they the best athletes on the field. Right? So I asked you earlier, I was like, Hey John, I'm just looking at all these, all these rankings, man. And people loving Dallas Turner over Chris Braswell. They're looking at Braz. Braswell will probably be a second round pick or something like that. Turner's a top 15, 12 or so guy. But man, just me watching the film, I understand the upside. I understand coaching and all this kind of stuff, right? I love Braswell's film and Dallas Turner's film made me go, man, stop running down the middle of that dude. Stop running past the quarterback. Hey, if you had a plan, you could have done so much better right there. And that's coaching, right? But I love Braswell's film so much more. Can you just speak on those two guys in particular? Yeah, it's really interesting. And I kind of fall into what you're saying. I have a Dallas Turner rated more, but I could see rated higher. But I could see why Chris Braswell, why you like Chris Braswell so much. And I like him a lot, too. I think the thing that really sticks out for me and him, the the one trait that I think is going to do him well in the NFL is his ability to sequence moves. I think he does that be- so much better than Dallas Turner. He does it so much better than most of the edge defenders not t- not named late to Latu in this class. You sure. see him when he's stopped on his first move. You see him being able to sequence to the next one and be able to win. And another good thing about Brad as well is he's well-rounded. He brings some power to his game. You can see him bring some speed to the game. He can win inside 
high side and through an offensive tackle. So he has those. He's pretty good against the run. You know, he's kind of just a well-rounded dude with his one, I think, trump card being his ability to sequence moves. And then you got Dallas Turner, who's extremely athletic, extremely long. You see the get off, you see the burst, you see him being able to gain, gobble up ground in those first three steps extremely well. You're seeing, seeing him being able to corner. But the problem is, is you don't see those positive traits utilized maximally on a ba- on a snap by snap basis. I think outside of the ending of the Auburn game, you see him, you know, he bases his entire game off that long arm. Yeah. And when you're so fast and you're so athletic, the fact that you're basing your your whole game on a move that is kind of power based and you kind of got to go through the offensive lineman's body to make it successful, I think that's just a bad pass rush plan. It's a bad configuring of you know his pass rush repertoire. If he could get you know some slight tweaks there, I think he's someone who can express his pass rush ability so much better if you know he's more of a speed based guy who's winning with speed and then using that power as a change up rather than as his primary his primary the interesting thing about these guys is i think it kind of draws a correlation between the two penn state rushers you know as in chop robinson who's another super athlete guy and then addison isaac who is another guy people see as more well-rounded but in that case it's a little bit different because i would 100 times take chop robinson over addison isaac and i don't think addison Isaac has the traits that are necessary to make him a competent NFL rusher, despite the fact that he was kind of well-rounded in college and stuff. I think he's missing some of those finer details to make him much better. Whereas Chop Robinson, you know, he's still learning everything with his hands. He's still learning, you know, how to take pass rush angles, how to manipulate offensive linemen with his footwork, all these types of things. But you still see him with a high pass run, pass run weight and ability to really stress off of the tackles because Man, his get off, he's going to put offensive tackles in scramble mode immediately with just his upfield burst and his ability to get to the corner and corner effectively. You were you were talking about sequence and moves together, and I, I've always pulled this play and looked back over. We got Braswell on the right side of the screen. I'll just I'll just play it. Let me ask you this. Do you think it was his plan to to sequence moves like like this together, or do you think Okay, pardon me. Was it his plan or do you think, all right, mid bull, I'm like, all right, I feel him going heavy outside. Let me just naturally feel my way back inside. Like, like, do you like, because I think if you're an edge rusher and you can naturally feel stuff like that, like, like Parsons is, is rough around the edges, but I feel like he has a natural feel for like body movement and momentum and stuff like that. So when I watch this play from Braswell, I don't think he planned this, but I think he felt it. And I think you can get a lot of sacks in the league just like feeling stuff. You see what I'm saying? Oh, 100%. I 100% think he was feeling it because as you see, as he's creating that extension, I think he's going – like the thing you see about the best counter moves and the players that exhibit the best counter moves is in the NFL is they – attack that first move 100% to win. Mm-hmm. And then they counter off of it. You see these guys that kind of, they think too far ahead. They're like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna initiate with the bull and then I'm going to try to transition. And they kind of get stuck because that's not the avenue that the offensive tackle was taking them. Rather, whereas a guy like Brazewell here, he's going to attack with that bull rush as much as he can. And then once he feels the guy sit down and he feels that inside corner a little bit lax, then he's going to arm over and then win. And I think that's exactly what you did there. And I think that's what Micah Parsons kind of does with his stutter step approach. You know, when he's creating those stutter steps, using those euros, he's waiting for the offensive lineman to determine what, where is he going to lean? And then Micah Parsons is going to go the opposite way because he's so much more athletic, so much quick. He can win on a consistent basis that way. And I think Brazewell kind of did the same thing, but just initiating with a bull and then feeling off of that. And like you said, I think the best counter move specialists in the NFL are the guys that attack that first move wanting to win and then once it gets failed then they take the avenue of least resistance yeah man you know i was watching um jonah ellis from utah right and you know he's a he's another run down the middle of you all-star right but 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 you could tell when he's kind of thinking about what he wants his move to be because he'll be working he'll work and then he'll like he'll like okay spin move now but Mm -hmm. his spin doesn't gain ground you know what i'm saying you just kind of spin in the same place you was at so in my mind you 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 was thinking about spinning but you didn't Mm -hmm. feel the spin so that's a great point by you go ahead yeah and it's funny every time i watch him it's just hilarious to see his uh upfield burst that makes me laugh because he kind of like waddles up the arc he's he like does. He does. He does. and then spin okay okay then now, now i'll spin or now i'll try to club armor over and it's just like he's trying to do with that, that kind of what micah parsons does mm-hmm. once he gets into the contact zone but he kind of does it the whole way up the arc sure <laughs> 
Sure. And, and like, it's just like, it takes too long. It's kind of like, you remember like Braxton Miller at the senior bowl, how yeah. he would do like 16 moves in his, uh, in his initial release. And yeah. then he would create all this types of space. And they'd be like, yeah, that's great. But you're not going to have six seconds to get to the break point in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the same thing with Jonah Alex. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I was having problems with him, man, you know, and, and that's, a, and this is, do you like the 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 technical nuance guy or do you like the athlete, man? Jonah Ellis's BGO is ridiculous. His first step, you know what I'm saying? But like, boy, like, stop running that circle, man. <laughs> like, give me something else. Quit running, <laughs> quit, quit running down the middle of people big and stronger than you, dog. <laughs> give, me, give me something I can, you know what I mean? So naturally, I just end up bumping guys down the list because of that, right? You know, just I'm like, how do you win? That's my whole thing. If I could see you win. All right, you may not be the most athletic, but I see how you win. Darius Robinson is a violent dude. I see how he wins. I see him, man. It was it was it was a play versus LSU. He was trying to get. He was just, he was, he, you just see him violently striking people. You see him violently, you know what I'm saying, extending on guys, right? So you can see how Darius. You say, okay, Darius Robinson get busy, whether he's an A gap or in B gap, right? Tell us a little bit about Darius Robinson from Missouri. Oh, I love Darius Robinson. He, you know, in a typical draft, I don't usually like these really big defensive end, you know, tweener types, yeah, that, yeah. you know, play three technique, big defensive end. They're kind of like that 285-ish. They run in that like four, eight range. I usually don't like those guys, but I think Darius Robinson has a lot of nuance to his game that allows him to win on a consistent basis. And I think it's why you saw him have so much success against a high level of offensive linemen, not both during the year, but also at the senior bowl. I think he's got the best snatch in the class and he does it in a really nuanced way that I don't think a lot of people are catching up on. When you see him uh, initiate that long arm. When pass rushers initiate the long arm, their head spot is where you can kind of tell what their move off of the long arm is going to be. If it kind of stays in the same place, they're going to use that long arm bull rush. Mm -hmm. If it kind of drifts out to the side opposite of that long arm, then that's when they're going to start looking for that hammer, that chop, you know, all those different types of moves. But then when you see it kind of drifting towards that long arm, that's when you see that snatch move that he's so good at. But the thing that he does is so smart is that when he initiates that bull rush, his head comes opposite his long arm. So you see a lot of offensive tackles. They think, okay, he's either going to be bull rushing me down the center or he's going to be trying to go to this outside corner. So you see them a lot of times either sit down or keep drifting a little bit upfield. And that's when he grabs cloth and then he pulls arms over, snatches that inside shoulder and goes arm over. And he consistently hits on it because guys don't think, because he uses that long arm so much that people think like, okay, I need to sit down. He's so powerful. I got to sit down on this. And then he's just going to snatch him. And so I think that is a type of move that is going to translate immediately to the NFL. Man, this, this dude, this dude, like snatching, grabbing cloth, great vengeance and furious anger. He's lined up over the left tackle and the uh, tight end right here. Number seven, bro. Well, go get your ass back up there. Uh, the, uh, the uh, tight end and number seven, bro. You just see, you just see bodies hit the floor. Once he grabs cloth and just, mm-hmm. I right, get your goofy ass off me or right here, the right tackle versus LSU right here. Boom. Fall. Ugh. Ugh. And, and it's just like, man, I know what you're saying about the athlete dog. I know you can teach the athlete, but you ain't teaching you ain't teaching yeah. Dallas Turner this. You can't teach him this. Um, how like how how much do you do you value like the violence? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, man, technique is cool, bro, but like if you're not a truly violent player, you can't be taught this. Like nobody, you you can't just pick this up if you don't have the asshole energy in you to do it. So so like where do you rank that when you, you know, watch these edge guys or the tackle guys, right? The asshole energy, the violent stuff. I think it's a very important. I think it's more important for guys who kind of play through contact. You know, if you're one of those speed rushers who's kind of pairing swipes, you know, using swipes, you know, kind of like the old Ohio State, the Nick Bosa, the Joey Bosa style, where they're using the double side scissors, you know, they're doing club moves. They're not letting, they're kind of doing surface area reduction, not letting you land on them and then using that to get on with them. It's not as necessary. But these guys that are playing through contact, you know, using long arms, using bull rushes, using long arm, uh, hammer fist, long arm club, these type of things, they got to be violent. The violence is incredibly necessary and it lends itself well to the NFL. You know, you're not going to be an alpha in the NFL if you weren't an alpha in college and you kind of mm. see that on the tape. It's uh, consistency, consistently. And I think that's something that, you know, people probably don't believe it by how big of a D-Law fan I am now. But in college, I wasn't the biggest D-Law guy because I didn't value, you know, the kind of the violence that he would put together in his pass rush moves. 
And I think that really translated to the NFL and allowed him, you know, you saw it his rookie year against the Detroit Lions when he's hitting those arm over moves to get those clutch sacks. Those are violent arm over moves. He's not just, you know, going through the steps. He's violently clubbing those wrists, violently grabbing those shoulders, pulling himself through. And I think that translates extremely well. I mean, I mean, look at him on the right side of the screen here versus the left tackle dog. Like, bro, like that, he wants to. You see the head? You see the head position? Watch, he does the same thing here. Boom. <laughs> you see, that was kind yeah. of the opposite. Instead of doing the snatch, he did the club. He kind of leaned it like he was going to do the snatch. The guy pulled his weight inside and then club, go outside. Mm. John Oney, boys. <laughs> Great to have you here, sir. Uh, yeah. Violent hands, man. There's a there's a bunch of dudes in this draft that got strong, powerful, violent hands. We talked about um, Braswell got some violent hands. You know, we um, we like uh, Robinson's violent hands or whatever. But uh, Jared Verse. I was going to say, you got to bring up the number one in the Violence Hall of Fame for this year. Man, I was watching Jared Verse versus LSU. And this left tackle for LSU didn't have some, 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 some struggles. And, and not even, I don't know if he's bad or not, but he just plays some gangsters, man. But Jared Verse, like, he's, he's Whiplash King this year. I, I'm going to find his film and, uh, and uh, pull it up. But just, you can do so much if your initial strike got people like this just bouncing heads back all day every day and then he'll work something off of that he'll go back inside off of that and i think that helps in the run game pass rush whatever you want to do with a man so if you're just looking at like a balanced player besides leatu latu and i promise i'm not hating on uh dallas turner here but jerry verse is my second edge guy where do you have him and tell us about jerry verse yeah 100 percent. i have uh jared verse uh right behind chop robinson for number three as the number third guy like mm -hmm. they're Basically, like, Chop Robinson has a 7.85. Jared Verse has a 7.83. So they're effectively, like, just right there. Mm -hmm. Tags touching, as Brian Barros would say. Yes, sir. But uh, Jared Verse, man, he stole, he's, he stole the most souls out of any offense or out of any edge defender in this class with his power. You know, you just see the, – the interesting thing is, is normally when you see guys in college that are as, F, as effective power rushers as him, they usually weigh in that 270 to 275 range. And the fact that he – I don't know what he played at, but he weighed in 258 at the combine. So I'm guessing he probably played in the 265 to 268-ish range. Yeah. And the ability to generate that much power on contact is so impressive. And he's not just moving guys back. He's lifting dudes like off the ground. They're hopping, falling on their back and – you know, getting drove into the dirt, you know, it's really impressive. And he brings in some, um, he brings in some nuance. You see him use layer in those manipulative footworks to get them, you know, kind of not knowing what's going to come their way. You know, he can, he'll do it when they sit down on his, when they sit down on the long arm, then he'll uh, counter with the club, you know, all these different types of things. He's a little bit more nuanced than he gives credit. And he has the ability to win with speed if need be. He's layered in those reps throughout. It's not consistent because he's such a power-based player and does so much off the long arm and gaining, generating that uh, optimal inside hand positioning and creating that extension that he doesn't really go to his speed and that high side rush that much, but he can do it. I think in the NFL, when you see, you'll see him start to layer that in a little bit more because he won't be so much more powerful and explosive than everybody. I just think his ability to be successful, his ability to translate to the NFL and transition will be a lot quicker than most of the other edge defenders outside of a guy like Law 2 in this class. Man, I just think Jared versus in year like three, like once he's in his grown body, left side of your screen right here versus right side, man, once he gets like his his grown body and, you know, he gets that, gets that damn, gets that, look at, come on, man. <laughs> come on, man. man yo, Dal 66 having, having a rough year with these guys. But put some damn paint, up, look at his neck, look at, look at, yeah. look at, look at the extension he gets on this bam man dog like put some peanut butter on this kid <laughs> jared verse probably end up like what two seventy maybe 65 or so i don't know as a as a as a pro as a grown man pro and man you he he walks in high floor right now because he is like a rundown guy he is a, i know what to do with my hands i i can set you up kind of guy i think he can do some some high floor things for you year one but i think by the time he gets to year three or four or something like that, man, dude, dude's going to be a menace. He's going to be a menace. And he's one of my favorite, favorite guys in this draft, man. I first seen him funny enough. I was watching my, uh, uh, North Dakota state kid, the left tackle senior bowl, dude, no teeth, blonde locks. Uh, psh, I forgot oh. my man. Offensive line, North Dakota state. Forgot his name, but, 
Oh, I know what you're talking about too. He got a, he's got a strong. Uh, it ain't it ain't Dylan Redones. It's, it's, it's somebody else. But you, you know what I'm talking about though. Senior Bowl guy, mm-hmm. that dude, right? And I remember watching him versus Albany, and I was like, "Hey, man, I want to like this kid, but this this dude at Albany kicking his ass, and I don't just want no small school dude from North Dakota State getting whooped by some dude from Albany." And I, he was having a hard time with, with this miscellaneous Albany character. I was like, "Man, I don't like this dude." But the Albany kid was Jerry Verse, and he played yeah. <laughs> he played there before going to uh, Florida State. So I was like, "All right, cool. That makes a ton of sense now." So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a Google buddy's name. I forgot his name, but but you know what I'm talking about though. You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about though. Well, yeah. shout out to him. Let me uh, get some quick takes before I get you out of here. Just some quick opinions on some of these day three guys. Okay, have you seen Nelson Caesar from Houston? I have not seen Nelson Caesar. I've heard good things, oddly enough, and a couple guys from PFF have been telling me to watch him. Mm-hmm. But I haven't been able to because I've been doing too much other stuff for PFF, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's my bad. <laughs> yeah, man. He's uh he he's uh he's literally linebacker and edge guy, but not like outside linebacker edge guy. Like he plays Mike and then he comes down, he puts his hand in the dirt. Like it's very strange. Uh, uh kind of like um Tyrus Wheat, you know what I'm saying? Last year oh, from Mississippi yeah, State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he does some of the same kind of kind of things as him. Not as good as Tyrus Wheat as um, I don't think so, but you know. Uh Mohammed Kamara, have you seen him? Yes, yes, I have. Yes, Tell us I about have. his violence and his propensity to tear shit up. <laughs> he's good, man. He's fun. He's, you know, he's obviously small, 6'1", 248, you know, uh, one of those type of guys. But the thing that really impressed me about him is he gets off the ball really well. He gets off the ball. He stresses offensive tackles, uh, pass sets. He's able to uh, create those advantageous situations where offensive tackles are kind of scrambling as they get to their spot. Um he has a pretty good two-hand swipe and stuff. And I think he has the ability to be a – he has the general mold to be a effective NFL pass rusher in the NFL. I think he has a lot of those traits. I think the one thing that kind of worries me about him is that at times he kind of leaves his hand – like there's multiple rushes where his hands are like down at his waist when the time the offensive tackle is initiating his strike. Sure. And those type of things, you know, those th- things won't work in the NFL. you got to be much quicker with your hands. you got to carry them up here high so that you're ready to either swipe away, club, long arm, all those type of things. But he's a fun player. I think on day three, he's one of those developmental types that I think that you're hoping by the end of his rookie contract, he can give you some serious pass rush specialist uh, uh, production. Cody Malk was one that was getting his ass whooped from, yes, Malk. Malk, from yes, uh, yes. Jared Verse. Yeah, pardon me. Um, let's see. You you uh, you wasn't the biggest fan of my guy, Austin Booker. Tell us why you can't stand and you loathe Austin Booker. Tell us why. Man, it's not like, like I'm playing. You I'm watch playing. this film, and there's very impressive reps where you see, you know, you see the the really good spin move. You see, you know, the potential to to corner quickly kind of you saw it at the senior bowl too you know every like once every every three reps you're like whoa okay that that kind of impresses me but then you can't weigh 240 pounds to run a 4.8 i'm mm-hmm. sorry you know the list of effective nfl pass rushers with that is basically none i think the only one that was ever that ever became decent was arden key from lsu mm-hmm. who was that light and that slow and able to put together like even like a a backup role in the NFL. Mm -hmm. So that really worries me with him. And I'm someone who values the tape way more over measurables and uh, way over measurables and like athletic testing. But I have those things in my evaluation process so that they can, you know, keep me, keep me in line. And if I don't allow those things to keep me in line and I just say every guy who I like that doesn't, you know, meet those thresholds is going to be a, is going to uh, beat the odds, so to speak. I, there's no point in even putting them into your evaluation process. So the fact that he didn't meet those requirements, you know, it's just someone that I wouldn't take a chance on. And he's someone who I don't have high hopes for in the NFL, despite the fact how enticing some of those high end reps can be. I feel that way about Tyler Guyton, but I ain't gonna say nothing else. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, I'm right there with you with Tyler Guyton. Man, what's going on, man? Let me let, let me just pause this edge stuff for a second, man. So, <laughs> so where you? So, so me and Will still did a show this morning. Shouts out to him and boy, we put our capes on, our Superman capes on. We said nothing but good things about Christian Jones and damn Blake Fisher, but boy, I said bad things about Tyler Guyton four times in that show. But <clears throat> I see a lot of people, and look, shouts out to everybody in their analysis. You did the work. You watched the film. Trust your own eyes. I feel you. 
I don't see it in Tyler Guyton as a as a twenty four guy. I, I'm seeing people say that Kingsley Sua Matea is a is a twenty four guy now. That that's that upsets me a little bit. And I'm just I'm not I'm not big on the athletic. Don't you know what I'm saying? But I don't really see your black belt in blocking. Just I'm not big on that guy. I'll much rather take the lunch pail dude with weird looking feet that just wins. Dewan Jones. I was big on Dewan Jones last year. Mm-hmm. So tell me where you at with the athletic offensive lineman that may not block that well, but they got upside. Because you just said it's my pass rush. You just said it's my pass rush. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess O line is different. So tell us about what you think about Tyler Guy before I go back. Uh, to that's you. risk of sounding like a giant hypocrite on your channel here. Mm-hmm. Uh, not a big fan, especially of a guy like Guyton. You know, when he land, like I have, I think four screenshots of during of the way the one thing i like to do with offensive linemen is is i like to take screenshots of their body positioning when they land their strike you know Mm -hmm. where's their body weight positioned are they you know balanced or are their head over their toes are they leaning one side to another i just have these gotten ones where he's all the way leaned over like head over tea kettle with his hands, and that's just not the position that you want your first round offensive tackle to be. Leg straight, like, leg straight, leaned over, yeah. hands. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna yeah. get, mur- and that's why he was getting destroyed by Darius Robinson over and over and over again at the Senior Bowl. Because mm-hmm. if you're gonna lean like that over a guy that's gonna that's a snatcher, yeah. you're gonna get destroyed. Yeah. And in the NFL, there's a lot of snatchers, and he's gonna get beat consistently until he gets that figured out. Now, you, everybody talks about oh, the size, the movement ability. He's the only guy that's 6'8", that ran this three-cone, that ran this short shuttle, blah, blah, blah. Now, first of all, you talked about height and length. I think height – I especially think length in trench play is so overvalued. You will hear guys talk mm-hmm. about people that have 35, 36-inch arms, but they throw strikes that give them 32-inch – I mean, mm-hmm. if you have 36-inch arms but you're a scooper – Yep. Like, I don't care how, I don't care if you have 45 inch arms. If you're a scooper, you're not using your length effectively. And that length is not an effective positive trait for you because you don't use it. Petra Paul. You know, it, <laughs> it, yeah, Petra Paul. It, it's something I learned le- watching Carl Lawson for the longest time and talking to Carl Lawson, you know, in private, you know, he's a guy, he measured in with 31 and I think at eight or 31 and a half inch arms. And he's winning with long arms because he's effectively using that one arm is longer than two principal. He's, uh, beating guys that you know have these 35 inch lengths aren't because he's using his length more effectively. And so many of these guys that have long lengths, like Tyler Guyton, they don't use their length effectively. So if you tell me they have 35 inch arms, I don't really care. Like it, he doesn't use it, he's using 33 inches of it. So what does it matter? I've been preaching that so much. People <laughs> telling me about Jordan Morgan and his arms. But Jordan Morgan got a damn black belt and left tackle dog, so it don't matter. He know how to, you know, say he know how to work your elbows. He know how to fight your wrist. He know how to fate, faint, and fake and bite. You know, hey, I t- mean, t- take about the- who's the best left tackle of our generation? Probably Joe Thomas or sure. Trent Williams. Joe Thomas had thirty two and three eighths inch arms, yep. and he talks about it all the time about how it's the art of how you use your length. And I think this is something that really helps with my like time in jujitsu and doing judo and doing wrestling. You know, you will go with guys that are bigger, taller, have longer length than you, but you're able to establish better, superior grips on them because you're effectively using your length so much better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think a lot of evaluators don't really look into that part of trench play. Man, come on, uh, John. I don't expect one last thing before I get you up out of here, man. Um, Tell us why you like Chop Robinson because Chop Robinson is a is a run down the middle of you all star and run past you champion. And. Maybe he can use a little bit of coaching. I don't like to call him raw. I don't I don't use the word raw as much anymore because I've seen raw players that are rawer than the dudes I used to call raw. I call those guys rough around the edges now. I don't think Chop is super but duper raw. I do think he's rough around the edges though. Uh but tell us why he's your guy and you love him to pieces and he's fantastic. The first thing that really blew my mind when watching Chop Robinson is is he has a really inefficient stance. Is you will see that like his butt will be below his hips. He'll mm-hmm. kind of have his head up, kind of like in a frog ish type stance on yeah. the edge. But he still has the most explosive get off and upfield burst in the class probably. And the fact that he was able to still stress offensive tackles pass sets despite the fact that he was coming out of an inefficient stance just really blew my mind to the type of athletic ability that he has on the edge and that when you put him in a good stance he's going to really stress those offensive tackles past sets on a consistent basis when he's able to get those vertical takeoffs without like a rush action to slow him down 
And then when you add in, I think he has a pretty good swipe game. He has a pretty good parry game. It's not, it's not up to NFL level par yet, but I've seen enough of the foundational principles there that I think he can build off that to where he can be a success, really successful high side rusher in the NFL. And I think that translates extremely well. And when you look at the NFL, the guys who are at the best of the pass rush game, these are all guys that can win high side. They can win with parries. They can win and not let you touch them. Because in the NFL, the thing about today's NFL is with the way they're getting the ball out so quick, if you're winning through contact contact consistently as a pass rusher, you're going to get a lot of pressures and not going to and but not convert a lot of those pressures into sacks True. these high side rushers these guys that use speed they're going to convert at a higher rate just because they're getting there on a quicker basis yeah man i was watching him <clears throat> and the first thing i noticed like you said so he got in the stands right and it's not odd for you know defensive linemen to be on a knee before the offense does they're all right cool he's on a knee and the offense gets to the line and like that knee still down i'm like <laughs> Like, all right, <laughs> when's, he, when's he gonna get ready? <laughs> and the knee probably only came up like an inch off the ground, yeah. right? He, he just he, he just sinks his hip and he keeps that. And I'm like, all right, there's no way he gonna get off the he gonna get off the ball good. Yeah. <laughs> and he flies off the ball. Yeah, it's so weird. And he runs down the middle of something, and he's strong too. He mm -hmm. runs down the middle of these people, and you know, and you just keep watching. And the more like you can block them but he'll, he'll keep fighting and find a way to get off of you. And he'll, he's another, he's another cloth puller. I don't know if he does it on purpose though. Like, Darius, like, <laughs> like, like, like Darius Robinson pulls cloth with intention. Mm -hmm. Chop seems like he's just fighting for his life. Yeah. And he just grabbed the first thing, but it ends up being fantastic. So if mm -hmm. there's anybody that's rough around the edges, that's a run down the middle of you all-star that has hope, I think it's Chop. I think Chop got a lot more hope than Dallas Turner does because Dallas, I don't really see, I don't even see great like reactions out of Dallas. I just see his athleticism. You know what I'm saying? But Chop is very reactionary. Like he could feel you on, like he, he, uh, I was watching versus, um, um, Paris Johnson from last year and, yeah. and Paris is an athlete. He was giving Paris fits with just, <laughs> with just ball get off and running down the side of him. And I'm like, man, Michael Parsons walked so that these new athletic strong guys can, can run. And I was like, man, I wonder if chop Robinson can, if you line him up at like linebacker and just, and just blitz him. If he's if he's two yards behind a quarterback on a regular day, would it even out if he dropped him back two yards back? I'm just thinking of fun ways to use Chop Robinson, but he's an elite athlete, and I don't necessarily know what to do with him because I'm technique nuance guy. Um, but I can see where he's at now. When I mentioned him reacting, you put your finger up and did this. What that mean when I when I talked about Chop Robinson? I think reaction. that's another thing that people don't talk about is the reactions. You know, the ability to react quickly. That's something that really can't be improved that much once you get into the NFL. It's something you're born with or you're not. Sure. And you see these guys that are able to react quickly off stimuli that they're not think that they don't think is coming. You see, there was a really good quote I was reading somebody was right, I forget, sorry I can't give the credit, but they were saying that the best players in the NFL have top-notch reaction skills. Mm. When you see guys trying to anticipate too much, that's when they get caught. That's when they get fooled. That's when you know, things go awry. And that kind of really resonated with me, you know, like going back again to like my jujitsu kind of career, you know, when I'm able, when I'm in the zone time, I'm able to, they, we call it like water. You're able to, you're able to react to what's coming to Flow. you. You're able to mm -hmm. seamlessly react and defend and then an attack. And then it's kind of, you're not thinking about it. You're just, your body's kind of reacting. Whereas when I'm trying to anticipate something coming my way, that's when things go awry. That's when I miss a grip. That's when I think he's going this way and I grab a certain grip and he's actually doing something different. I just put myself in an extremely bad situation. You know, I think of a, there was a time when I was in the absolute finals as a blue belt in a tournament and I was going against this really big ultra heavyweight guy. And I was thinking, but he had a really good guard. So I was thinking, I got to get on my back and pull guard first because I was really comfortable there. But the problem is, is that I was anticipating his reaction to the pull so much that when I pulled, I was trying to throw my foot up into his hip, but I totally missed. And I just spun myself around literally into an armbar and he armbarred me and I got armbarred in like 30 seconds in the absolute finals. One of the most embarrassing moments of my jujitsu career yeah. uh, as a com com as a competitor. Yeah. And it was just kind of, it kind of brought me back to there of anticipation versus reaction. And my coach kind of did that he's like you were thinking too much you were trying to anticipate what he was going to do too much rather than just being like water you know like you are in the training room you know like if you would have rolled with him in the training room it would have been a much more competitive role and you may have could you could have even have won but 
you trying to think too much is what puts you in a perilous state right there. Man, I got a similar story, but I ain't going to tell it, man. But it is what it is. Yo, John, <laughs> that's, yeah, man, this has been fun. It's been fantastic. Glad you was able to come through and kick it with me. And I hope that as a question asker, I hope I did a good job, man, because, you know, a lot of people, they they, they go places in the – the interviewer we ain't interview we just we just chopping it up or whatever but you know the the, the dude that's doing the, doing the talking they don't really do a great job of giving you stuff back so hey man we 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 a cool little pair man let's do this again one day you feel me yes sir 100 dude you're fantastic a lot of these that i think the best thing that i can say is it felt just like a conversation it didn't feel like i was being interviewed and that's sure. you know that's where the best content comes that's where the best conversations comes that's from so I would love to come back again. Hopefully after the draft, we can chop it up again about who the Cowboys pick, you know, yeah. we can either be mad or happy and all that type of fun stuff. We're going to be, we're going to be happy about one pick, but we're going to be ecstatic about three others. All right. That's how yeah, it's going to go. There we go. Tell the people where to find you, man. Tell them where you at. Uh, find me on Twitter at John owning. Also me and my buddy, Joey Ikes are going to start doing a YouTube Q and a thing called the blue hour lunch hour. Mm -hmm. Look it up on uh, both of our socials. Subscribe. We're going to be starting, I believe, next week, next Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to be doing like at lunchtime for like half an hour to an hour each day, just taking taking questions, talking about whatever's going on in the Cowboys land. You know, uh, now that I'm working at PFF, I don't really have an avenue besides Twitter to really put out my long form thoughts about players, about what's going on on a week to week basis. So this is kind of a great outlet for that. Hey man, tap in if you ever got a long thought about somebody and you want to share it over here, man. We got we got some we got some help over there. And hopefully my subs will go over there and you know what I'm saying fulfill y'all, man. So appreciate you for being here. Sir salutes, Wadi Cop. You know what that means. All right, y'all, man. Y'all hold down for the Flatowski Walls and Peace Whiskey. Till next time, man. Salute.